All right. Now, as you see, the name of my talk is my American grandfather was a postmaster in Ontario. And I'd also like to thank you all for your indulgence here, as my presentation is about 40% uh, philatelic related and about 60% genealogy or family history. Uh, and yet my hope is, is that uh, it's 100% enjoyable to you. Um, my grandpa lived a really large life and i hope that some of that comes through in my talk tonight so thanks for letting me be here and share that as i merge my own uh, philatelic passion with my family heritage so i'll start off by saying that i put together the presentation with the help of three things first is the recollections of my late father 95 years old here at his birthday and uh he had a lot of interesting stories and recollections about his dad that we're going to be talking about. The second thing was Barrett genealogy. Now, I went through dozens of boxes of family history. This is just a small portion. Uh, and I went through them a couple of years ago. And we've always known about this part of my grandfather's life, yet not you know, until some really cool items, including many philatelic pieces, uh, were found in these files in 2021. Took a lot of searching. But uh, the third uh, helpful thing to put together the presentation was one specific book called The French and Pickerel Rivers, Their History and Their People. It was published in 1992. And I spent a lot of time Googling my uh, grandfather's name and uh, places that were pertaining to him. And uh, it's a pretty challenging Thing to locate much about a, a lodge a lodge that he had in Ontario in an area that's now listed on a website called Ontario's Ghost Towns. So uh, it, it was quite a challenge, but uh, I'm so grateful and pleased how things unfolded. Now we're talking about a tiny little place that is about five and a half hours by car from Buffalo, uh, New York, and I'd say about four hours northwest from toronto and it's actually more accessible by train which is how most folks arrived there a hundred years ago and i use buffalo as the starting point because that's where i grew up that's where my dad of course raised us and my grandfather lived and so this was my grandfather's journey up up this line here and uh by the way the the book was absolutely amazing uh after hearing about it locating it became quite a challenge. Uh, the three that I saw on eBay at the time ranged from $150 to $250 in price. And uh, there's a couple there now uh, that are quite inexpensive. I think one's $29.99 and one's a little more than that if you're interested. But uh, at the time, there were only those expensive ones. And because of the higher cost, I chose to look further and I found that there's six copies in various libraries across North America, two of which are in Canada. So the next thing I did was contacted the Houston Public Library. I live in Houston, and that's where I am now. And I was fortunate to arrange for interlibrary lending of one of the books from another library. And the author did an amazing amount of work to compile the material on an extremely remote area uh, and it was fascinating to see my grandfather's name and uh, part of his story documented inside there. Now, uh, we'll start by saying my grandfather's name was Nelson Wheeler Barrett or Nelson W. Barrett. He was born in 1898 in Buffalo. He joined the Army in 1914, one month after his 16th birthday. He's shown in the back row there next to his mom and his dad and those are his sisters, my actually my great aunts in front of them. And uh, he uh, served five years in World War I, working his way up to supply sergeant. And after his military service, he played semi-pro baseball for a couple teams in Western New York. And he took some college classes at the University of Rochester. And he had a real vision for business. There's no exact dates from family archives or anything. Yet sometime in the early 1920s, we know he traveled north into the wilderness of Ontario, and he fell in love with Mother Nature there. 
and he built a lodge called Wanapate Lodge. And uh, it's on the south shore of Ox Bay, which may not be familiar, but Georgian Bay down here may be more familiar in the lower left. And uh, we're going to focus on this area right about in the middle here. Here's Ox Bay as uh, we get on with some slides. So this um, this is where the French and Pickerel River, the French on the left here, the Pickerel River on the right, come together and uh, where my grandfather's Canadian adventures actually began. Here, this is from the book, the original site of Nelson Barrett's Wanapate Lodge. So it was right there. Now, here's a page out of the book that uh, shows a different view, gives you a little better feel for the geography we're talking about. Here is uh, the mouth of the Pickerel River. Here's the French River. And uh, here's Wanapate Lodge down here at the bottom off of Ox Bay. And uh, thank goodness for uh, Google Satellite, because this is what I found today. And the lodge would have been right here. So the August 3rd. 1923 edition of the Buffalo Morning News noted that Nelson Barrett hosted his family at the lodge that summer and his mom and dad, his dad was actually also named Nelson. It was Nelson T. Barrett was his father, Nelson True, and his two sisters, they came north and enjoyed a 10-day vacation at the lodge. And this is just an example of little things that I was able to find either online or in those boxes that I showed earlier. And Nelson W. Barrett placed ads in the September, October, and November 1923 issues of Hobbies Magazine in Buffalo, New York. Here's the masthead inside. And he was advertising the fall hunting season. And uh, he, that began a cycle of, uh, for my grandfather at least, of being up north during the fishing and hunting seasons from May to November. And then he would promote his Wanapate Lodge from about December to June in Eastern and Central U.S. cities, visiting a variety of them. And um, he, he would get on the train. Uh, he went from Eastern United States to the Central United States, and he would speak to civic groups and exclusive clubs, hopefully to attract a high uh, end and a I guess you'd say executive clientele in New York City, Albany, Syracuse, Buffalo, of course, Pittsburgh, Erie, uh, Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, Chicago, and Detroit. I mean, I'm sure he was quite the train traveler and racked up a lot of frequent miles on the rails there. Now, January 1924, the Buffalo Morning Express noted a function where my grandfather provided the venison and used the occasion to promote Wanapate Lodge. So it's pretty neat. He notes here a preparation of a buck deer, which was a donation from Nelson Barrett Jr., proprietor of Wanapate Lodge, the best yet. So um, that was a pretty interesting thing to uh, uh, uncover. And uh, here's a picture uh, from the family of my grandfather when he was at the lodge. Hey, maybe this is the venison that he was serving at that gathering in Buffalo. huh? And uh, next up is a brochure that he had made that promoted the hunting season and the 1924 summer fishing season. And let's look inside. There's some uh, things. These are just several of the pages. Uh, Buffalo's best known big game hunter will be there. Uh, some more pages show the detailed map of the Wanapate Lodge District. Here's the lodge off of Ox Lake there towards the bottom portion. And uh, this page shows the rates of the lodge, $5.50 a day, $50 minimum charge, uh, $25 for a hunting license, or uh, $21 for a round-trip car fare from Buffalo. Let's see what's next. Okay, so this shows how to contact him and when. Uh, his name and his business address there. And... Uh, dates that he was at the lodge and then back in Buffalo and then back at the lodge. You can also know that the address was in Key Junction Post Office. So, um, and this one kind of illustrates the fishing season dates there and the hunting season dates and a nice picture of an evening on the French River with a quote beneath it. And uh, here's some used pieces of postal history, a couple postcards from the Canadian Bank of Commerce. 
and they acknowledge receipt of registered letters that my grandfather had sent. And uh, here's a, a cool postcard, a picture postcard with images of Wanapate Lodge. This was sent in 1924 in September, and it was mailed to my grandmother when they were courting. This would have been about 18 months before they married. And the back of it uh, is addressed to, her name was Viola, Miss Viola Copper. That's Starin Avenue. I remember my dad living on Starin Avenue in Buffalo. And uh, they called her Vi, and the back says, Dear Vi, am now fixed so that I'll probably be in Buffalo about Saturday or Sunday. And he signed it Nels. So this is September of 1924. So Nelson Barrett's second promotional uh, booklet for the lodge included some fascinating black and white uh, photos inside that helped market a trip to the lodge. And from these pages, you can kind of get a better picture of what the Wanapate experience was actually like. There's showing off their catch there and there's the canoes and here's the uh, cafeteria area and people uh, enjoying some time together there, maybe eating a meal. Here's some folks swimming and a sequestered pool at the Bad River, which is in that area as well. Uh, it also noted the uh, virgin fishing, had bass and pike, musky, uh, lake trout, great northern pike, and then there's deer, bear, ducks, partridge, the occasional moose. So uh, it was uh, quite a spot to, to go to and attend. So as stock of these booklets began to run out, the last ones were sent with this flyer that announced that a new booklet was being prepared for the 1926 season. So this went in the previous mail outs, but this is what you would receive. And uh, so grateful to find uh, uh, this booklet here in that folder, a nice drawing on the outside of the, with the out, outside of the lodge. I mean, it kind of gives you a, a sense of, you know, not only how rustic it was, but how big it was. What a, a, a great uh, place to go and spend a week or two. So uh, dates and transportation options are listed on the front of the booklet, and uh, they're followed by more text and some interesting pictures. Uh, here's more about hunting and how wonderful uh, hunting was. 33 guests came in the fall of 25. Uh, we'll see uh, in a minute what they hold. But here's a uh, some of the catch from the hunters, and uh, it certainly was one of the highlights, as was hanging out around the uh, campfire uh, at night. And this image is also really special to me because it has an image of my grandfather on the left here. Uh, he would have been around age 27. Here's a close-up of him, and it's uh, really wonderful to find a, a picture of him, uh, any picture really of him at that age. So the next thing that I found while Googling things was an interesting uh, booklet, Your Vacation in Ontario. This was produced in 1926, and it had mentions of a lot of different uh, lodges and places uh, to consider uh, summer uh, adventures. And uh, inside at the bottom here was a listing for Wanapate Lodge with his name there, Nelson W. Barrett. It noted that there was 40 rooms without baths and uh, prices to the side there so um that was a a, a pretty neat thing um next up we're gonna hark back to buffalo's slogan 25 years prior which was to promote the city and the 1901 pan american exposition consider that the world's fair that occurred in buffalo in 1901 put me off at buffalo now buffalo had 250 trains arriving in the city from all over uh, North America every single day in 1901. And so this slogan, put me off at Buffalo, was a common thing to see on train brochures at the time. And this, this one was actually on an advertisement for a restaurant in the Ellicott Square building. And uh, my grandfather's 1926 Wanapate marketing book, booklet change that slogan to put me off at Pickerel, where the lodge was located. And it also included information on for railway agents in various cities to get transportation to the Ontario wilderness. And uh, a list of 
prominent people who'd previously visited the lodge were noted elsewhere in the booklet, along with three really impressive testimonials. And I'll, I'll uh, show you one here. This one is from a coal distributor in Buffalo. And one of the company's owners notes that their week long trip to Wanapate was delightful. So the fishing was good. The lodges guides were friendly and the equipment was excellent. So I'm proud to say that uh, my grandfather knew how to treat people well and have, uh, you know, demonstrate good customer service. So he would get letters like this. So another page touches on the terrific fishing in the area with great catches, as we noted, of bass, trout, pike, and muskies. That was the real draw. In fact, several Buffalo newspapers reported on the action at Wanapate, and my grandmother, then married, was shown pulling in a nice one here. And uh, here's a caption uh, right below it. Takes a girl to hook them. Mrs. Nelson W. Barrett snapped in the act of landing a good catch. Needless to say, Mr. Fish did... Uh, not escape. Now, that's just part of a remarkable two-page spread from the old Buffalo Courier Express that I found in the family files. And uh, one of those pictures, it was really indicative of two things to me as I, you know, looked at this. One is how much my grandfather actually was able to network with people. You know, he must have gotten either a reporter or a photographer to come up to the lodge, probably for free, and, uh, you know, enjoy a week and take these pictures and report on it. So he was really an astute businessman and uh, was was good at networking. The other thing was this lady in the canoe here at the bottom, when I read all these captions, um, you know, I realized that that was the mother of the dentist that I went to as a child. So uh, um, there's Dr. Mimak's mom down there. So, uh now here is a uh, interesting Wanapate cover, which has a pickerel postmark on it and 22 cent postage to a bank in Toronto. Uh, pretty neat that they had nice stationery available at the lodge. And around the time of this cover, my father, Nelson Richard Barrett, was born. And he was actually at the Wanapate Lodge when he was six weeks old, as was his little brother, my Uncle Clark, who would follow about. 16 months later. So here's another uh, bank confirmation card with regards to a registered letter sent to them by my grandfather. Now, this one was addressed directly to him in Pickerel River on Ontario, unlike the previous ones we saw that were sent to Key Junction. So now let's focus on the post office in the area of the lodge. The terrific book that I found has a entry that's specific to my grandfather, a man by the name of A.S. McConnell was inducted in 1926 as Pickerel River's very first postmaster. He had a store close to the town railway station where the mail arrived, and McConnell served for a year, and then he stepped down, and a fellow named Harwood Glenn Bonner was then given the post, yet several residents balked at at that because he was a newcomer to the area and he resigned after about six months. Uh, next, the wife of Robert Mowers, a fellow who owned property next to the railway station, was considered for the position of postmistress, yet my grandfather was also one who was recommended. And the book then suggests that Nelson W. Barrett was considered for the postmaster position, yet inferred that nothing came of it. Well, uh, as the story goes here, documents I uncovered in my late Uncle Clark's files uh, prove otherwise. And I wish I'd known this over 30 years ago, and I'd have been able to contribute that information to the book's author. But uh, first, here's a notice from the District Superintendent of Postal Service in Toronto to Harwood Glenn Bonner, the outgoing postmaster of Pickerel River. And it mentioned that Bonner was to oversee the office until a new appointment was made and that the assistant postmaster, Charles Johnston, could handle the appropriate duties. And a forwarding address for Mr. Bonner was also requested. Next, also dated August 11, 1927, is a document from the same office noting that my grandfather was in Toronto at a meeting 
regarding the postmaster opening. It mentioned that Mr. James Ludgate, 58-year-old fellow who owned a mill in Perry Sound about 80 miles away, would be consulted regarding the position. And Ludgate had been a candidate who recently lost an election, and he wasn't in favor for some reason of Mrs. Mowers being the postmistress. And the final decision about the open position would actually rest with Mr. Ludgate. And it's interesting to note that the author of the letter there uh, asked my grandfather to keep the memo confidential and destroy the notice so the information would remain intact. Well, uh, us Barretts are pack rats, and uh, I'm really grateful that the letter didn't get destroyed, and he just threw it in a folder, I guess. So next is a letter from the District Superintendent of Postal Service in Toronto on official stationery, the Deputy Postmaster General of Canada, based in Ottawa. And uh, it was mailed to Mr. Ludgate in Perry Sound, noting that the mower's recommendation had been quashed and that instructions to appoint Nelson Barrett as postmaster of Pickerel, Ontario, had been issued. So Ludgate actually wrote here at the bottom in his own handwriting, is this satisfactory? And he signed his name near the bottom. So uh, pretty interesting piece to help document things here. Now, this one is the September 9th, 1927 letter from the District Superintendent of Postal Service in Toronto to Nelson Barrett, announcing his appointment as postmaster of Pickerel River, Ontario. It also noted that a new assistant postmaster would be appointed too, and he hopes that Charles Johnston would still be retained for office work. And the holy grail of the whole story is the official notice from the post office department in Ottawa. It confirms the appointment of my grandpa, Nelson W. Barrett, to be postmaster of Pickerel River, Ontario, in the electoral district of Perry Sound, dated September 7th, and it's signed by Deputy Postmaster General Louis Joseph Gabry. Now, uh, that fellow, the Deputy Postmaster Gabry, actually went on to become postmaster. He was instrumental in uh, the early 30s in mechanizing the post office there, as well as uh, helping bring about the use of more airmail. So this fellow um, had a quite a, uh, a place in Canadian postal history. Now, uh, as our family tells the story, Nelson W. Barrett is believed to be the first American ever appointed to the office of postmaster in a Canadian location. Uh, other than uh, verbally, uh, verbal family stories, there's no documentation of that fact, but um, somehow they got a hold of that and passed it on. And my father also said that he may have also been the first American to be a notary in Canada as well, or at least one of the earliest known American board notaries. So um, pretty interesting stuff. About 10 years ago, before these items all surfaced, when I was trying to confirm that my grandfather actually was a postmaster, I found documentation on the internet here at the library and Archives Canada site. And as you can see, it puts the date of his appointment as September 10th, 1927, instead of the 7th. And the date that he moved on from the position is blank. An interesting notation there is the asterisk in the cause of vacancy column and the explanation that, quote, in compliance with the Privacy Act of 1983, certain personal information has been deleted from this file. And it sure would be interesting to be able to follow up on that aspect of things and find out what might have been there or would have been there. So this is, next is a, a wonderful photo of Nelson W. Barrett from that time, possibly when he was postmaster. Um, this is one of the cherished things. It's about a original, maybe 11 by 17 black and white photo here that's framed in our home. Um, and uh, next up is a cover mailed from Pickerel River, possibly during my grandfather's tenure to Buffalo, New York. We can't quite make out the postmark here, um, but it was found in the same folder as many of the items that we've already seen in this presentation. So somehow grandpa wound up with it. And uh, I just sense it was likely from the time that he was uh, a postmaster there. 
Wanapate Lodge got some uh, really fine stationery in 1928. Kind of looks like birch tree bark. And uh, I sense this is from the summer of 1928. And I sure wish the stamp hadn't been cut off on this cover. But I'll bet it was done by my late stamp collecting Uncle Clark as a youngster. He started collecting in the mid-30s and was uh, anxious to add any stamps he could to his collection. So actually, this is addressed to Fordham Drive in Buffalo. I remember that as a, a, the next family address after Starin Avenue. Inside the envelope was a wonderful two-page letter from my grandfather in Wanapate to my grandmother in Buffalo. And among other things, the handwritten portion provides instructions on how to get my infant father's playpen across the border and through customs and and that bookings at the lodge were so good that they would likely have to turn some away during the middle of the season. So that was a nice confirmation of how well he was doing as a business person um, and a proprietor and host. Nelson W. was also pleased that a typewriter had arrived as he was probably comfortable with that use of that from his time in the service. I remember as a youngster uh, being a very fast a uh, typer with his two fingers, a hunt and peck typer. So uh, he certainly knew how to write uh, documents that way. Now, the back of each page of the stationery has a detailed map of the Wanapate district on it, noting the area's geography and a location of the lodge. Uh, he didn't have to put this on the back of stationery, and he, he really went all out, and that's, that's pretty neat. So also in the archives was a check made out to N.W. Barrett from a customer in Williamstown, Massachusetts for $13, which apparently had bounced. And there's a two cent excise stamp affixed to it, which was probably a tax paid at the Canadian Bank of Commerce when it was initially deposited. And the front also is signed by a notary and stamped protested for non-payment. Uh, no idea if the, that amount was ever collected. But the next piece of postal history is a fun one. It's the only item I've ever found that's associated with Wanapate Lodge other than the family files. And the front uh, proclaims that they're landing some big ones in the Pickerel River. And uh, there is a Pickerel River, Ontario postmark on it. And the sender writing to a relative in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania notes, quote, well, here we are. And can you imagine me landing some of these big ones? Well, we are. Sorry you could not be with us. A fine, This is a fine place. Good eats, kind people, and beautiful scenery. Regards, Uncle Sam. So that's pretty neat to have added to the collection. So here's a canceled check from December 1928 for over $1,600 to Gregory Greek and Company, payable a month later with 8% interest. And it was probably for a loan to Wana, uh, that was given to Wanapate Lodge, possibly used for rental payment of what is known as the Crown's land. And the province of Ontario managed the use of shore lands and the beds of most lakes and rivers. So maybe my grandpa had taken out a loan for some of those payments, and that's what this is reflective of. So I also found entries online for a couple other mentions of Wanapate by searching on a family Ellicott Square building address. Uh, this shows 460 Ellicott Square. I sense that my great-grandfather, Nelson True, had an office there. And um, so I uh, wonder if uh, there would be more things popping up. And unfortunately, I've not been able to find these two items themselves anywhere, an Outdoor America from 1928 and a Field and Stream magazine from 1929. Because I'd like to see what else they wrote about the Wanapate Lodge, but hopefully someday I can uncover those. And one of the last things that I did turn up was a Western Union telegram sent by my grandfather to my grandmother, his wife by then of about three years. And it was sent from Key Junction, Ontario, about an hour from Pickerel River by bicycle to Buffalo. And it mentions that all is well and refers to a car and a mortgage payment. Finally, the French and Pickerel Rivers book uh, has a section on Nelson W. Barrett and his Georgian Bay camp. 
not Wanapate Lodge Camp, but Georgian Bay. And it notes that sometime in 1928, my grandfather knocked down Wanapate Lodge and moved that big thing to a spot near Bass Creek where the fishing was supposedly better and would make his clients happier. And uh, residents assisted with the move. He wound up somewhere down here, I think the red spot of Bass Lake. And uh, this little picture here is what it would have looked like around 30 years ago. Now, I got to say that the author of the books took some really <laughs> flagrant liberties when he noted that in the text there that Nelson Barrett, like so many others, went broke in 1929. The author said that he left in late fall on a southbound train, never to be seen again in the area, unquote. And maybe some of this is what was omitted on that list of Pickerel River postmasters under the Privacy Act. Uh, yet Nelson W. Barrett was a very astute businessman, and he did not go broke in 1929. What most likely happened that I've been able to put together is that when the fall season ended, he returned to Buffalo like always. And then when the great stock market crash occurred on Black Tuesday, that's October 29 of 1929, I'll sense that my grandpa saw the writing on the wall that it was unlikely that his vast customer base would be able to spring for luxury hunting and fishing vacations. So he simply never, ever returned to the Georgian Bay area. And I've found no documentation of that. That's just my hunch. And I've never found anything pertaining to him giving up his position as postmaster. But what I have found is confirmation, though, that he definitely had money. And here are three canceled checks dated the following February, January, February, and March 1930, showing large payments to that same Gregory Greek and company for $4,600, $4,700, nearly $3,200. And I wish there was a way to correct the written information that the book's author had put out three decades ago, yet I'm sure that that person has likely passed away and there's not going to be a second edition. But uh, um, at least this kind of uh, writes the, that story uh, for the purpose of this talk. So uh, to round out things here, what did my grandfather do with his life after that? Well, as I said, it was pretty big. He worked out of an office here in the Ellicott Square building in Buffalo with his father, Nelson True Barrett. Nelson True was an attorney who had an office there. And Nelson W., my grandfather, did collection work. And he excelled incredibly at it during the Depression. And he became quite wealthy. Uh, this was uh, this building's still there. I took this on a recent trip to Buffalo, and uh, beautiful, beautiful. If you ever get a chance to go to Buffalo and you're in Lower Main Street, just walk into the lobby. It is incredible. It's it's absolutely beautiful. This was the largest office building in the entire world when it was built in 1896, and it was the largest office building in the world until 1908. And uh, as I said, my grandfather worked out of here and uh, he began buying houses from local banks in the 1930s for literally pennies on the dollar. And many folks at the time couldn't keep up with their mortgages and they faced eviction. So Nelson W. frequently rented. They, he would buy the house and rent back to many of these owners. And they just loved him because he made it possible for them to remain in their family homes and and not have to leave. So uh, uh, it was a win-win for everybody. And later on in the 1940s, when my grandfather paid off many of these 15-year mortgages, 15-year mortgage was a commonplace thing at that time. Uh, so when he paid off many of those on those properties, he sold a good number of those homes and he began buying several large, prominent buildings in downtown Buffalo. And one of them is the Walker Building. It's an 11-story warehouse. This dwelling is still there. It was built in 1915, about when this picture was taken. It was home to the Walker Shoe Company. And uh, here's a choice piece of vintage postal history from that business, which is not easy to find. Uh, as you can see, this one has an invoice on it. I've collected uh, or attempted to collect Walker Shoe Company uh, postal history for about the last 25 years. And I think I have three or four items total. It's just not easy to find those things. Uh, they were in other locations, uh, I believe other cities besides that. And uh, 
Here's another later one uh, that I found. And uh, the address that of that building is 37 Franklin Street. These earlier 33 and 35 had uh, other smaller buildings, which later became parking lots on it. But that's the address to those. And my grandfather marketed space in that warehouse initially and uh, called it the Barrett Building. When my grandparents would build a beautiful 3,000 square foot penthouse on the top floor where they both lived out their lives. It's right there in, in uh, Lower Franklin Street. The Barrett Building was renamed the Merritt Building. And that's what I always knew it by as a youngster. And it should formerly the Walker Building, very desirable space. This is from the probably around 1952, I believe. And it notes each floor is 6,000 square feet. Uh, the penthouse would have been 3,000 square feet up here. And uh, here is uh, what the building looks like today. It's office condominiums. Each floor is owned by a different owner now. The family sold it in 1990s uh, after my grandmother died. And the new owners have renamed it Cathedral Park Tower. And uh, to keep moving on, just blocks away was a uh, the 12-story D.S. Morgan building he bought. He acquired it and later sold it to Erie County in the mid-1960s for just a dollar. And my grandfather called that civic gesture a deposit in the account of good citizenship. And... Uh, he sold it to Erie County because the Morgan building was then raised. This would be in the mid 60s to make way for the new Ed Rath Erie County office building, which is still there. And uh, actually, here is a beautiful cover sent to someone at that the Morgan building there. It's extremely rare, rare with a full set of the 1901 Pan American Exposition transportation commemorative stamps. These are America's uh, first bicolored stamps. There were uh, two color stamps from the 1869 issue, but those are considered definitives. These are uh, America's first two color commemoratives. So uh, I thought I would show that to our stamp collecting friends here. And uh, we're getting to the close here. He also bought the Buffalo downtown garage. This would be at the back of the Merritt building as I knew it. Um, and it fa this faces Pearl Street, it's still there. And he purchased the other side of the block a building known as 268 Main Street, which of course is on Main Street. This is an image that I found from the 60s, and it looks different today, but this is how my grandfather made it look. He put on a modern facade on a much older front, and he won a national award for renovating it and making it look like this. I, I sense my dad might have in some slides that I'll later uncover a, a color picture of this, but... Uh, uh, it was gray and kind of silvery and uh, and and black, cobalt. It was really nice. This is diagonally across from the Ellicott Square building. And another property that he acquired was the Greystone Hotel. This opened in 1897, and it housed many people who visited the city in, for the 1901 Pan American Exposition. And here's an attractive cover sent to my grandfather at the Greystone from the Buffalo area convention and visitors bureau it's nice that they had a connection and uh, he could house guests uh to the at the hotel and and they would announce uh, the graystone as a place to stay if you came to buffalo and the last dwelling he bought was the prestigious building at 800 west ferry street still there this has been an exclusive address for several 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 generations an amazing place and after living an incredible rich life for nearly 74 years, my grandfather died in 1972, which the Buffalo Evening News duly noted. And he was interred with a 21 gun salute in Buffalo's vast forest lawn cemetery. That's where President Millard Fillmore is buried and numerous other local dignitaries and celebrities rest as well. And, uh, so I'm happy to close by mentioning that he was a member of the American Philatelic Society, as well as the Society of Philatelic Americans. And here is his 1972 uh, SPA membership card. Uh, that building is at 37 Franklin Street, if you ever drive by there. In fact, I used to park cars there for the hockey games and uh, then run down to the auditorium and get a ticket to go inside. But 
Uh, if you go to games, you may pass this building if you're there. But next, here is the only picture that I have of my grandfather and I together. This was taken on my seventh birthday uh, in 1965. Uh, his birthday was February 24th, and mine is February 27th. So we always celebrated together. So that's a, a charming photo that I like. And if you're wondering, the Pickerel River Post Office closed about 20 years ago in 2004 after, after providing 129 years of mail service. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, I'm happy if I can to help with any questions you may have. And uh, for those that may remember my book, there it's pictured. It's available at the APS uh, website or in their gift shop, Amazon and eBay. Uh, you can contact me at that email address. There's a book, uh, a Facebook page for the book. And I actually am getting down there my last carton. I've only got nine copies left. But thank you so much for having me uh, speak to you and share my family and philatelic stories tonight.